Brother Woods, Brother Price, and men and brethren. Well, Brother Woods, there's no question about it. You are an eloquent man, and I appreciate uh, your eloquence. And were this debate to be settled uh, by eloquence and the ability to persuade people with speech, I have no question that you would make your mark. We are going to appeal to a higher motive than that. I want to uh, state an official appreciation for preaching so much of my text. It's, uh, I appreciate that, Brother Woods. As has been asserted freely, there is no question about an indwelling. Uh, he even favored us with a great number of the texts that God dwells in us, and Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit dwells in us, and quite frankly, that has a glad sound to it. And we love that message that the Spirit dwelleth in us, and that God the Father and His Son takes up their abode with us, and that Jesus Christ knocks at the door of the church and bids to come in and sup with them. And that God's eternal promise that I will dwell in them is true. I find it exceedingly difficult for anybody to conceive that they would do the people of God a favor by taking the personality out of those texts and embodying them in a concept of the word or the scriptures. Here is a modified form of deism, an ancient heresy which proclaims that God is transcendent to his creation, not intervening in the affairs of men. That uh, ancient heresy teaches that the world operates eternally upon the basis of mechanical and unchanging laws of God, rejecting revelation from God and holding to the light of reason and understanding within man. Uh, they proclaim that nature is sufficient to establish uh, religious doctrine and practice. Now the opposing view that I am counteracting tonight states that the Holy Spirit is transcendent in his person to the redeemed, the chief objects of God's attention. That the Holy Spirit is not, in fact, himself joined to the individual spirit of the baptized believer. When we have this categorical assertion in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Believers only access to the truth cannot be the utilization of unaided reason or mortal powers brought to play upon the Bible, the revealed word of God. Certain personal advantages that may have been the result of the indwelling spirit in the first century are seen as being withdrawn from believers due to the completion of the scriptures. That the scriptures being complete are a total source of utilization of the Holy Spirit from without the child of God. Now I affirm that this is heresy in the rawest and most definitive sense of the term. It is contradictory to express revelation and implications. Whatever may or may not be said about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us representatively, God did not make that statement. He did not say that his spirit dwells in us representatively. He did not say that the Spirit dwells in us only through the Word. For that responsibility, uh, that statement, our speaker shall take the total responsibility in his affirmatives. God has not exempted himself from his creation or his Spirit from his people. His Spirit is called the Spirit of Adoption, which identifies the Spirit with God's children as well as with his word. The deficiencies of the old time were not due to insufficient written testimony. That is to say, the Holy Spirit 
was not limited in his work with men in old times simply because the testimony was not complete. Men in the first century were said to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Colossians 4.12, without a completed volume. Without a completed canon, the Ephesians were admonished to put on the whole armor of God, having, among other things, their loins girt about with the truth. Before the compilation of the scriptures, in which the Holy Spirit works exclusively, it is categorically stated that God had given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. As a matter of fact, the very scripture to which our beloved brother referred, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, refers to the law of Moses and not to the writings of the apostles. It is what's called the scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation. We are not repudiating here the whole counsel of God. We love this word of God and stand behind it and want it proclaimed. But this Bible is not the Holy Spirit. It is the sword of the Spirit. And that the Spirit could wield that sword external to people's persons is the point in question here. The deficiency is not due to the amount of the word that has been written. Whether the word has been written or whether it has been spoken does not add one power, one width of power to its thoroughness. Our opponent forgets that the early church did have all of the word. It was spoken, which is equivalent to writing. Man's deficiency is due to the fact that he is experientially in another world. And the scriptures deal with truths from the world to come. Man's assistance by the Holy Spirit in understanding the scriptures does not have to do with ordinary entrance into the kingdom of God. But as the Holy Spirit said to the Apostle Paul with the apprehension and comprehension of the dimension of the truth, that you might be able to comprehend with all saints what is the height and breadth and length and depth and to know the love of Christ that passes all understanding. Now I am affirming that that comprehension cannot come by a working upon man from without, that it must come from a working within, that a man is strengthened with might by God's spirit in the inner man. Is there a deficiency in the word? God forbid. Let no one dare to assert that. Cataclorius stated that the truths of the scripture are able to furnish the man of God, make him thoroughly furnished unto every good work. We have in the gospel something more than a moving of holy men to write as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The apostles possessed the Holy Spirit of God. It was that possession that opened up their understanding, not a mere retention of academic revelations. Further, these foundations expressed to the recipients of the gospel that the promise was to them and to them that are afar off, even as many as the God, our Lord our God shall call. These same apostles prayed that believers which had heard their message might be strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. My question is, is this strength administered external to the individual's person? At this point, I will set forth some questions that I have for Brother Woods. Question number one, what became of the Holy Spirit after the apostolic age? Question number two, are the bodies of baptized believers the temple of the Holy Ghost? Question number three, are you in the flesh or in the spirit? Question number four, what is the ministry of the Holy Spirit today? 
And question number five, can the Holy Spirit be effectually given without being received? <clears throat> the word of God is declared to be sufficient of itself, able to make us wise into salvation, 2 Timothy 3.15. It's able to save the soul, James 1.21. The scriptures are able to comfort us, Romans 15.4 and to make a discerning division between the soul and the spirit, Hebrews 4.12. But this sufficiency is not asserted with the Holy Spirit in mind, but with the traditions and interpretations of men in mind. The connection of the word with the spirit of God is what makes it sufficient, and we are unwarranted at any point of time to drive a wedge between the word and the spirit. They travel together. If the word's in you, the Spirit's in you. If the Spirit's in you, the Word's in you. The possession of the Scriptures, though they are sufficient, do not, for instance, obviate the work of Christ. His ministry of intercession is still an absolute must. It states in Hebrews 7.25 that he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them, if the scriptures, in the sense of my esteemed opponent, are sufficient of themselves, can we do without the intercession? Or is the intercession somehow magically linked with the scriptures? Is it not separate from the scriptures? Is the mediatorship and the intercession of the Lord imperative to our salvation or not? And if it is, then the scriptures, in that sense, are not sufficient. The Spirit utilizes the Word as His unique utilitarian tool. He does not merely dwell in it. He uses it. It is His sword. I maintain that He wields it from within the believer, not merely upon Him. I recall to mind the words of David who is declared to be a prophet himself. As repeatedly in the 119th Psalm, he said, Quicken me through thy word. Some six or seven times in that single Psalm, Quicken me according to thy word. And yet that same David, in the same Psalm, prayed for the understanding of those very things which he prayed would quicken him. Was it that they were not discernible or understood by his intellect? No, it's that he sensed that the implication of them was broader than himself. While man is in the image of God, man is not God. Turning the tables, so to speak. If man is capable of thoroughly understanding what God has said, that's what makes him God, not the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. As for that, Christ is also associated with his body, which addresses one of the questions which Brother Woods has presented to me. Those that have been baptized into him are so much joined to him that he states, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Believers are the body of Christ and members in particular. And while Jesus Christ himself is called the seed of Abraham, Galatians 3, 16 and 19 tells us that if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed. Now I insist that that represents a very real union between the Godhead and the believer. That when Jesus said in Matthew, the 28th chapter, that men were to be baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, that he was speaking of an actual union with God that is wrought in our joining to Christ. That when Jesus prayed for those that would believe on him through the word of his disciples, that they might be one as God and him were one. I in them, and thou in me, and I in thee, that that was a real union, not a fabled union 
or a representative union. Brother Woods asks, since Christ's earthly body was literal, literally, actually, and personally indwelt by deity, and since I claim that my body is actually, literally, and personally indwelt by the deity, the third person of the Godhead, does this in respect make you equal to Christ? If not, why not? Let's first of all make plain that God said our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that the controversy is with what the Holy Spirit said, not what Mr. Blakely said. Further, the Holy Spirit dwelt in Christ without measure. He was the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. It does not in me. My container is smaller, but I have the same substance. And so do you if you are in Christ Jesus. Secondly, is the statement the Holy Spirit is deity and to be personally indwelt with the Holy Spirit is to be personally indwelt with deity, true or false? God said, I will dwell in them. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. I accept that as it stands. Is the following statement true or false? Given Blakely believes that only one third of the Godhead really and actually dwells in the individual Christian and the other two thirds of the Godhead, the Father and Son, are not really in the Christian at all. No, that is false. You see, the scriptures tell us that we are a habitation of God through the Spirit. That the Spirit is the representative, not the Word. Ephesians 2, 22, habitation, habitation of God through the Spirit. He is the Father and the Son's representative. Is it true that one without literal, actual, and bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit is as obtuse and dense as the apostles were before they were baptized of the Holy Spirit, though they had the words of Christ? If that was not true to some degree, why did the apostle pray that the church might receive the spirit of wisdom and knowledge in the revelation of him? Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 18 through 20. Why did he beseech them that they might open up the eyes of their understanding to comprehend somewhat of the magnitude of our redemption? You see, I proclaim to you a salvation that's not academic. I proclaim to you a redemption that's not cursory or elementary. It is involved with height and depth and length and breadth. It passes understanding. It passes knowledge. I insist that that's the case and it cannot be apprehended without you having the mind of Christ which is transmitted to you by the Spirit working in concert with the Word of God. Since you believe that the Christian cannot understand the Scriptures without a literal, actual, and personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Does this mean that the alien sinner can't understand the teaching of scriptures about what to do to be saved without a direct operation of the Holy Spirit? If no, does this mean that you think that the Bible can be understood by unbelievers without the Holy Spirit, but not by Christians without the direct indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that question is uh, rudimentary. Understanding is not addressed in that manner in the scriptures. We read in the word of God of certain matters in the kingdom, Philippians 4, 7, that passes understanding. We read in Colossians 1, 19 of spiritual understanding that has to do with the implications of the truth together with its intra-relationships and consistencies. We also read in 1 John 5 20 of an understanding that is given to us. We know that the Son of God hath come and hath given to us an understanding that we might know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son Christ Jesus. This is the true God in eternal life. Now does my opponent assert 
that eternal life is no longer associated with this transmitted understanding by God, admittedly working through the Holy Spirit. We understand, uh, we understand that by faith certain matters. They are not understood academically. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things that appear were made from things that do not appear. By faith, we understand that. John the 12th chapter and verse 40 speaks of an understanding with the heart that goes beyond mere intellectual analysis.